the sessions for this conference, and welcome to the conference. We're, anybody here who's been here before? It so seems the year goes very quickly, doesn't it? Suddenly we're all here again. Um, I'm Cathy Morris. Um, I work for a company called Impactissima, which is in leadership development, and I've been here several years, and you've probably seen me chairing these sessions a few times. Very happy to be chairing this session this morning, um, entitled um, The Learning um, Landscape. And we've got two great speakers this morning. Um, their session is going to talk about how the marketplace, the learning marketplace, is changing very rapidly and focus on what the major dimensions and um, drivers of change are in that marketplace. Um, David Perring and David Wilson both are, are from the Fosway Group, um, previously a company called Elernity, and um, they are Europe's main analysts in, the HR, in HR learning innovation. Um, you will have heard Don reference them this morning if you were in the keynote. Um, they're currently working on a very exciting strategic research partnership um, looking at what's going on, who's doing what with, with what um, in the learning um, marketplace and how customers and suppliers are responding to that. So um, you'll probably hear more from them about that. They'll be sharing some of that research. It's in its early days, but you'll be hearing more from them shortly. Um, I would just like to say that there, usually we, we have Q&A at the end. These guys really want to get you involved right up front. So this is interactive. If you've got questions and answers, throw them out during the course of the presentation, and they will also be throwing some questions out to you. So um, we're going to use the whole of the time um, with them, encouraging you to interact as best you possibly can. So without further ado, the learning landscape, guys. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Come on, this is your highly high moment. <laughs> oh, wakey, wakey. Oops. So, um, yes, good morning, and um, thank you for choosing to come to our session. Um, as Cathy said, we're going to talk around, uh, based on the research that we do with a lot of corporate organizations, where we see the key drivers of change around what learning is, how we're doing it, how we're managing it, and so on. That, that's not necessarily a new a new topic, but what we want to try and do today is to give you a bit of a framework to think about that that probably is a bit, bit more out of the box than some of the stuff that you'll be necessarily um, listening to in other sessions, which are often quite learning technology focused in terms of their, their agenda. Um, the other thing is, as Cathy said, the whole point of the structure of this session is to make you do some of the work, okay? I'll give that a pause to let that sink in. You can um, lock the doors now. Yeah. <laughs> so if you, are, um, if you are sat on your own, Andy, for example, you might want to sit closer to somebody else or whatever, because what we want to do as we go through this is we're, we're going to present a basic framework for, talk, for talking about this. We want you to discuss it with the people you're sat near a little bit, and then we're going to ask you what you were talking about and what you thought. So we're going to basically try and create a framework for discussion get you to do some of the work, and then we'll just present a few things and leave and take all the plaudits, if that's okay. All right? <laughs> so, just a quick introduction. As, um, as Cathy said, we're from Fosway Group, which we rebranded from a company called Elernity um, last year. So I've spoken at pretty much every one of these events, learning technologists. I am that old. Um, and Obviously, what we do as an analyst is we track change, we track investment, we track success in the market, typically with large, larger corporate um, users and so on. Um, and, and therefore, what we want to talk about is not what we're trying to sell you as a, as a platform or a solution, but actually what we see from talking to real organizations. So I'm CEO and, and founder of it, and David. I'm director of research, so I'm very nosy. I want to know what different organizations are doing internally, but also the organizations that they're working with in terms of their partnering their, with their learning technologies, their strategies, and we distill that in our research and our insights. So, so David does all the hard work. Um, the, Don, in the opening general session, uh, talked about the strategic research partnership we've just put together with learning technologies. So um, we'll talk about that a bit more at the end. But basically, there's a whole research process that's around really trying to understand at a granular detail level what, in reality, all of you guys are actually doing, who you're doing it with, how much you're spending on it, and how successful it's really being. 
Um, so there's a lot of stuff around that. To give you an idea of the pre-research that we'll talk around a little bit, for some of the data points in this, we had 990 people respond to uh, basically in January. So it's, uh, it's quite, uh, the aim is to kind of produce the, almost the, the industry standard benchmark for the market, which is woefully lacking, unfortunately, at the moment. There's no real good data around this. So in terms of structure and the agenda, um, we want to talk really around what we see as the kind of key game changer areas. So these are almost the dimensions of things we see impacting the learning agenda and what learning is in the corporate environment. Um, and then we, at the end of it, we'll come back and talk about some specific things. We've got content in this as well. So we could easily spend an hour just delivering the content that we've got. But as I said, the, the, the aim of the session is for you to spend, you know, a third plus of the time in it with you talking to each other and then you to providing some kind of views from the floor. So, so please kind of get yourself teed up for that because we'll just sit and wait until somebody says something, um, effectively. Um, uh, so David, we've already talked about the kind of overall positioning. I mean, we've got loads of research. We have an analyst lounge downstairs in the exhibition floor, which we're hosting quite a lot of meetings on. But if you're uh, interested in doing that, and I think there's some, some handouts, examples at the back of things like the nine grid reports, which you may have seen, which we just announced the 2016 versions, and also some of the initial research that's coming from this partnership with Learning Technologies and Learning and Skills Group. So game changes in learning. I'm going to just talk about this at a very basic level, okay? There's a lot of sessions that you'll go and it will talk around gamification and social learning and you know, new approaches to content design and responsive design for mobile and, and blended learning and all these kinds of things. Lots of those words have the word learning in, okay? And in reality, what they are is often a micro view, a view of innovation within the bubble. What we want to do is step back from that a little bit and think about, at a more macro level, what are the key things that are driving change and, um, and how is that going to impact your agenda? So I've got one really overarching question for you to be writing at the top of the piece of paper with your notes, which is how are each of these key dimensions or key, key, key game changer areas impacting what you are doing in 2016 for learning in your business? Okay, so the aim of this conversation really is to provoke a, a kind of thought process around understanding how are you changing what you are doing in learning because of these things? Okay, if you are not, this is the kind of summary point we'll get to at the end, then you have got some really serious questions to be asking yourselves. Okay. So I want to start off really talk about it, and there's a, there's a degree of life cycle, but also kind of top down. You know, one of the things that you find, and we obviously talk to a lot of large organizations, learning is one piece of a much bigger people-related equation in companies. In a, lot of, in a lot of businesses now, learning is part of a, a, a larger HR function. How many of you exist, first of all, how many of you are from learning team? Okay, so half or so. How many of that learning, is that learning team part of a broader HR function? Okay, so probably about 60% of the ones that put their hand up. So the normal environment within, I mean, learning is obviously, and training teams are fragmented in, many, in most companies, but actually the corporate learning function is typically now part of a corporate HR agenda. And um, that creates all sorts of challenges, more challenges, in fact, than it does opportunities. And one of the things that I think we want to really think about is how is the way in which that HR agenda is changing, changing the way that you think about learning and the way that you engage as a learning team within that HR function, okay? In most cases, the learning team is a junior part of the HR function. It's not necessarily a big hitter in terms of the broader HR agenda or around investment. That's a really significant challenge. It's also wrong, fundamentally, as well, but that's the reality of how it is. So one of the things that I think you think about is how HR, and obviously within that, things like talent management. How many of you have got uh, talent-related initiatives running in your organizations? Okay. So again, fair majority, probably. Or in some cases, you may have a human capital function or human capital management. One of the things to think about is if you don't have this now, then actually what's happening with your HR function and with, a, with the sort of transformation agendas we're seeing is increasingly HR is going to take more of the overarching responsibility around the way in which the overall development and learning agenda is being set. Okay? And that's again a challenge for you. 
So some of the questions, and I apologize at the back. Can you, can you actually read those from the back? Okay, good. You've got better eyesight than I did when I stood there. Um, the, uh, you know, uh, whose LMS is not integrated with some form of corp, um, talent or HR-related process? Okay. How many of you is your, H, is your LMS integrated with talent-related activity in some way or some form? Okay, so more that aren't than aren't. Um, whose LMS is was selected as part of a wage, wider HR systems or transformation project? Okay, actually more people put their hand up there than put their hand up to it's, it's integrated. Um, you know, who drives the other parts of the talent life cycle? Career planning, onboarding, performance management, employee management, so on. What are, what are the other kind of pieces that are there? And how does that impact on things like learning systems? I'll give you a real example of this. We, what, an insurance, com insurance company wanted to recalibrate their entire competency model to make it align with career planning okay, for their learning academy. Their learning academy had 10,000 active learners a month. Their career planning had 80. Okay? But that's the, the kind of equation that's going on. That's the kind of macro change. Um, and in reality, the person that was responsible for the career conversation was more senior than the person who was running the learning team in terms of influence and the investment agenda going forward. Um, who thinks that their HR platform will drive them to change their LMS by 2021? That's six, five years. Okay. So again, when you look at the broader agenda, what we're seeing is actually quite a lot of things like LMS projects getting trumped by HR transformation and HR, moving HR to the cloud. So suddenly you find, oh, we're, we're looking at putting in, paraphrase, workday or success factors, and we're going to change our LMS and our learning platforms to go to it. We'll come back and talk later on about platforms. So there are a lot of drivers which are around process, around organization, around data, and around investment and strategy, which learning is not the master of its own des destiny. Okay. Right, what I'd like to do is just discuss that for a second with the people that you're next to, and then I'd like you to think about what are some of the key things that you think HR will force you to do in learning next year that aren't that because of the HR's agenda, not because of learnings. I'm amazed by the amount of decibels that we had over the last couple of minutes. Just to, to sort of move the conversation forward, um, so, what sort of things were you coming out in terms of your discussion? Because that was very loud from being this end of the room. We were tempted to leave, actually. <laughs> you may be tempted for us to leave as well. Sorry. <laughs> so what things were you discussing? What... Back. Um, the, so we moved over to, to just practical case study, right? Two years ago, we moved over to, to Workday, which actually freed me from my previous LMS to find a really good LMS that was a really good LMS and not a decent suite that did a lot of different things. Um, but the motivations are different. So where, right. where I'm motivated by things like user experience and impact, my counterparts and the rest of the HR organization will look at a product like Workday and look at you know, transparency of data, but at the same time, hey, it has to integrate with all our payroll providers. Hey, it, uh, you know, it has to be on all these levels, different compliances, because we operate in 60 different countries. So the motivation is different. Not to say Workday is a bad product, because I'm actually interested to see what they do with their learning product that comes out um, this year. Which is exactly, so you've, you had the opportunity, opportunistic timing of, of, of transitioning to Workday for Core HR when there was no learning offer and yep. effectively, therefore, it was a partnered scenario. Yep. Now, of course, Workday has announced its own learning platform, although that doesn't exist yet, and right. it's launched in the fall, as yep. they would say in America. Um, and uh, you know, it will evolve from there. So there are real, you know, there are real questions then around, in reality, for organisations in 12 months' time, what was that discussion? We've also seen organisations that basically have a desperate need to change their corporate LMS. Yep because they have fundamental compliance issues and have pulled the project, yeah. 
yeah, at the 11th hour, purely because of the fact that they thought Workday was going to announce a, an LMS, and they didn't want to invest in the wrong platform, right. quote. Yeah? Um, and, and of course, all the learning colleagues around there going like, and what do we do now? You know, because they, all the fundamental drivers hadn't changed. They were all still there. So on a systems level, HR is, is, you know, is starting to wag the dog. And if you, anybody picks up or reads the latest nine grid with report we've written around the LMS market, you'll see specifically referencing around how HR and talent is now driving more of those decisions. Yeah. But the other side is from a process and data point of view, it also is exerting, say, authority, a bit like the competency model conversation I just discussed. So. I, I think, well, I think what a product like Workday does is it raises the bar. Yeah. Yeah. But that raises the bar then for, because I think fundamentally that editorializing, but, but the LMS industry is really, really lazy. Why? Because they've got you locked into a multi year contract and you want to go through the change management process of going to something better. Right. With, with, with a product like Workday, that's, that's, and other yeah. products like that, that's the game changer. Because yeah. now HR systems can look sexy and they can look fluid and there can yeah. be user experience. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't but necessarily it's, mean it's if on it, all of us to push that with our LMS. Exactly, but it also doesn't mean that they're good at, at, at you know, whatever learning stuff you want to yeah. do. It's because, because they're good at the whole thing, the whole suite, et cetera. Okay, anybody else? Thank you so much. Rob? So I know staff. I brought you for a reason. <laughs> Carry the mic. <laughs> Uh, I mean, amongst our customers, uh, particularly the really big ones, we're seeing exactly what you described. So choices for their learning management system mm -hmm. are being made uh, not to do with the user experience or how helpful it will be to the organization, but what it integrates with and what IT will, be, will allow, uh, yeah. which I find really depressing. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh. I'll do this one. <laughs> My, my point really continues on from that, which is the danger of bundled products. So uh, in my organization, talent uh, and the performance management agenda is run from a group perspective um, and imposed upon us uh, segments. And uh, we, we're in a position where they have chosen, they decided they needed a new platform for talent and for performance management. Uh, and we're offered a bundle that included an LMS. Uh, now, at our level in learning, we didn't want an LMS. and We certainly didn't want the one they've bought. Uh, but we're SAP as well, the biggest con in business. Uh, 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 and so we, we are lumbered with something which not only do we not want, but isn't the best product. And I think this is, this is the real danger of bundled products. For a long time now, we've needed uh, the marketplace to be able to collaborate with one another to provide the things that they do best. Uh, and at the moment, we've still got a, a, an environment where particularly the LMS companies are trying to do everything. And as a, as a consequence, they can't do any of it well especially those that start with long-term legacy products. Yeah, I think, I think that's one of the things that, that is really interesting about this is, I mean, if we go back 10, 15 years, we had HR suites that sort of said they did everything, you know, and in reality, you, you tried that, pretty much failed dismally, and then went out and bought best of breed platforms. And I'm not just talking about for learning, I mean, recruiting, performance, management, and so on. What then happened was, those moved to the cloud or became more dominated by the cloud. And the, um, uh, we, those vendors themselves have now reinvented themselves. So if you go downstairs and talk to people like Cornerstone and Saba, which were often those best of breed choices at an enterprise level, they're now trying to sell you full integrated talent management. So we're reinventing that situation potentially again, but obviously now in the cloud. And that transition is where we are. But this is not just about a system, right? This is not just about systems. It's also around things like shared service functions. Yeah? But how many organizations have basically done a, sh a shared service um, a, a transformation project in HR, moved to an HR shared service model with HR business partners, and then learning gets pulled back in basically in the same model, even though learning was highly se separated before because it was very intimate to the business, whereas the HR process fundamentally wasn't. You know, not to the actual transactions of the business. So, so there's, it's, this is about, it's about, not just about systems, it's also around strategy and organization as well. So in terms of some of the I think, useful thinking that we, we like to highlight, to some extent, 
in terms of the priorities for C-suite, we took this from a um, Boston Consulting um, survey from a couple of years ago. The thing that Trump's learning is the talent agenda with the CEOs of your organizations. So if you want to be an influencer um, in learning, then you need to be an influencer around how learning supports talent. And that's a really important, f fundamentally strategic change in organizations. Maybe it's always been there, but it's becoming much more visible as the war on talent starts to evolve even faster. Um, from our research, we did this last year with the guys at HR World Congress. Um, HR's driver is to be a strategic partner, and they have a strategic agenda which is around employee engagement, increasing consistency of HR process, um, which is quite typically linked to cost and efficiency, but also things like better leadership management, talent pipeline, all these things that are typically wrapped into the talent agenda. And these are drivers. And again, if you want to be part of uh, an L&D function that is influential, you need to understand how that talent agenda is actually forming in your organization and be influencing in the appropriate places around performance, for example. Um, just some more data. Um, in terms of the whole process, we use a model around a, a talent cycle, which starts to sort of effectively try and segment that talent wheel. Um, our fundamental belief is that learning actually is the engine room of practically all of those segments, whether it's about performance, career development, whether it's about succession management, whether it's about um, recruitment, goal management, all these things are probably typically powered by It's really important that you're influencing around that side of the agenda. David, can you just put that out? Yeah, one, sure. There's one thing I want to point out, just to say, why do your HR colleagues think learning is, is not that big a deal? Mm -hmm. Because in their HR, in their talent life cycle and HR life cycle, it's that. There's one box in that 18 which says learning management on it. And that's the problem. Yeah? What they don't recognize is the role that learning plays across the whole life cycle. They see it as one <laughs> siloed piece. And if you're lucky, it's one in four of the the silos they're looking at, mm -hmm. if they've got any sophistication around the way they're looking at talent or human capital, it's probably one in about 12, right? So you're a 12th of their decision. And that's why you've got your, your influence around that becomes more limited. Okay, so in terms of the second game changer that um, I think we're a bit, <laughs> we'll see how quick we can go through this. Um, there's been some fundamental changes in the structure of learning. And that's actually in terms of the sorts of learning that we try to deliver and the media that we try to distribute as well. So in terms of the sorts of questions that we think are probably good prompters for the discussion, who's adopted 70-20-10 in terms of as part of their learning philosophy for their learning, learning organization? So is that about a third? Um, who's embedded uh, user-generated content, content in their organization? So who's proactively using their own user content. If you can put your hand a bit higher for me. So that's cool. so another key thing to think, these are all really key trends over the last few years. If you're not putting your hand up, it's an interesting thing in its own right. Okay? Yeah. So who's actively using blended learning in their organization? So creating combinations. Yeah. And finally, who's implemented performance support tools for their learners rather than providing courses? Again, what we'd like, and I'm not sure if we've got time. <laughs> so I'm no, 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 I want to do this one because this, this one's really important. Yeah, sure. So, so just like we did before, so how is what you consider learning to be, how you structure and run it and deliver it, how is that impacting your learning agenda going into tw in 2016? What are you doing differently in 2016 because of the way that you're changing your view of learning or 70, 20, 10, or because you want to get more informal learning or social learning, whatever it is, what are the things to do? Discuss, please. So who wants to go first? How's, how's, how is the, you changing the way you think about what learning is and how it's structured? So, so I work for a large organization, big blue chip company. That, um, so we don't do either of those first two things, um, which, as you say, you've got to think about why you're not doing those things. I know exactly why we're not, which is it's a huge company, really hard to change the culture. <coughs> everybody is used to classroom. And so us learning, going, well, I think we need to do this different. It's about how we can move that cultural, sh you know, make that cultural shift in order to get them to even want to do that. Yep. Um, you know, we were, we were talking about that's, that's a big piece, and I'm starting to hear people talk about it. Mm -hmm. But then you like, to make it happen is tough, right? It, it's amazing, you know, when you come to these things year on year, you forget how little this world is. 
right, this learning technology world and these conferences, that the majority of organizations are still fundamentally yet to change the way. Though with anything they're doing, they do a lot of e-learning for compliance. All right, that's it. That's the success we've had over 15 years at a macro level um, around it. And there, are, there are clearly organizations that have taken a much more radical shift. And as, but as I said, you know, go back over so to the previous point. So actually, sometimes the drivers of change in learning are you as the learning team, and you, you know, when you've got some of this other HR change coming on, you're actually you're a relatively small fish in that in that pond as well. So it, it's there are some real challenges. Okay, what, who else has got? So for me, it's polar difference between the first two. The first one can leverage a lot of human element and the second one needs technology and for me they're in their organization about 30,000 people globally very different um, we recently merged the talent acquisition talent management and talent development groups so we're spending a lot more time on roadmaps focused on where are we going how do we build a development culture how do we treat our hypos the way we want to how do we treat our general population and it's not easy to do because it's really hard to capture the 70% in a way that we could say, yeah, we reached the finish line or we're doing really well. For the other one, not totally not because we're so SAP LMS oriented that we have nothing else in front of it, which really means we're gener never going to generate that user content, which we so want to do. Right. Cheers. So I admit to working for a vendor um, no boo. <laughs> um, the change I've noticed is a lot more talking about like, the user-generated content. We're spending a lot more time, like today, there's myself, my colleagues, people here just as visitors, people on the stand. But we've got to do things like blog about today. Blog for our colleagues, we'll take that back to the office. That's a learning point um, to hear what others are gleaning from this. So again, that will go on our intranet. It might go client-facing or external, I'm not sure. But again, it just shows a bit of a transition. We're generating our own content. It's going to take sort of, I attend a couple of these today, a couple of hours later in the week, and then that will go up. And that's a little learning soundbite. The team will get something from that, and it's something small, cost effective. Yeah. I'm going to the back a lot, guys. You're not, de de <laughs> not delivering from the front. <laughs> I try not to, Andy. It's normally safer. <laughs> It's the orange shirt, it's easy to find in the back. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, we do all of that, and actually it's a, well, first comment, I think the first two, to do well, you have to have a culture shift even within your L&T team. You have to realize that as learning professionals, we don't earn learning, own learning, and that learning is owned by the learner, and we're there to facilitate the process. So while in the past it's kind of been our baby, and oh God, don't touch that. No, please do, because I can scale a lot better over 10,000 employees if everyone's contributing to learning rather than just my small team. And then the last one, the, the, around performance support, we've really been focusing on where in the past we've been so KPI and performance driven in the past, so it's really the, the what you do. This last year we've really seen that actually the, the strategic imperative is to get everyone to understand that the how you do it is just as important. And that's actually caused us to actually re-centralize learning and pull it out of the business because of what we see happening with really helping people understand the, the how we do things. Um, so that's not specific to the learning delivered, but how we are structured as an organization. So there's, there's a kind of fundamental shift, isn't there, in, in, in what, um, what learning is in organizations and the point of ownership and the point of consumption. Yeah, I mean the thing about this, the the thing about the this user-centered approach, so that you know the, the 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 learner owns the learning, but actually the learner also maybe owns the content as well, right? So as opposed to the learning function doing that, I'm just going to move. Sorry, I'm going to move qu quickly on. Let David talk a bit. Okay, so in terms of our view, I think that the, the, the challenge for us is in terms of the organisations that we talk to, we see a lot of people talk about 70, 20, 10, but very little execution um, and what execution does happen tends to not be about facilitating the 70% of learning that make you want to encourage in the workplace but actually trying to formalize the workplace learning in some way so it's a, a, and actually think about it as a delivery channel so it's a real big challenge most of the systems that we see both from a learning and HR environment don't do a great job even of supporting a 70-20-10 model in its own right anyway 
So your ability to try and execute that strategy is ha say, hindered or hampered um, by your ability to actually find a supporting technology to enable that in, its first, in the first place. And just in terms of the broad diversification in learning, actually, there's been so much learning that happens, and probably the most important thing that happens in your organization around after action reviews, continuous improvement. These are things that aren't typically included in the learning agenda by the learning department, but are probably the most valuable things about how to improve process, for example, in your, in your sales team or sales skills than anything else that you can deliver formally. So thinking about how you facilitate that ongoing development, actually at peer-to-peer -peer level, at a team level, is something that we don't see necessarily being facilitated by the platforms, which typically have a strong training delivery focus. Actually, they're trying to enable you to be a more effective training department necessarily than being a learning enabler. And I think that's a real challenge, We're seeing some significant shifts. But against that, when our survey that we did with the Learning Technologies Group, 90% are looking to increase their use of, of learning, their LMS because actually they know they need to get certain learning from certain people. And only 1% of those organizations are looking to stop so using that, LMS. That's a really important, really important point. If you go downstairs into the exhibition, you'll walk around a lot of organizations and there'll be people talking about, yeah, well, LMS is dead and it's kind of a bad experience and everything else. And it, in, in most cases, the experience the LMS delivers in, in organizations is not good. Okay? However, when we just researched this, we've had just under 1,000 respondents to this in the last few weeks. 90% of organizations, 90% of people said that they expect to either increase or leave their level of use of LMS at the same, as a minimum at the same level. Only 1% are talking about decreasing it. So all the drivers that cause you to have an LMS around administration process, compliance, reporting, all of those things are still there. They haven't gone. Okay? So it's not just about, oh, well, there's a magical new model and we're going to all do it through social learning channels and video. Okay, well, that's fine. Great. You're going to, you're going to do that. And we'll, you know, part of this diversification, there is a real shift in, you know, people are not just doing face-to-face -face and click and turn e-learning content for, you know, half-hour courses and things. There's a big shift in the types of content. We'll talk about that a bit later on that people are doing, but they still need the LMS there to do what they're what it was there to do and actually they want it to be more effective and in, in reality what we see with large corporate organizations one of their biggest challenges is consolidating because they have so many bloody LMSs they've got too many different things they can't possibly manage the delivery of it across their whole organization in any kind of coherent way so they're all that you know as well as all the innovation stuff that you'll see downstairs you've just got to think of a step back up and think about this systemically and think about it at a, an organizational level but also think about how some of that 70, 20, 10 and those things is re driving real change in what you are actually delivering, okay? as opposed to sits nicely on a slide at the beginning of the vision presentation, but then we're going to now talk to you about all the formal training we're going to do. And that's unfortunately still where a lot of organizations are. And the transition as we could sort of move from this side of formal learning into supporting learning in the workplace, supporting collaboration, actually quite often that's a greenfield spot. People aren't used to doing it certainly as a process in their own right. So that's the voyage of discovery as well as having the solutions to try and support it is a, a voyage of discovery. So it's not necessarily a perfect world and it creates more complexity and more challenges for you. And we know we you can't read the that. diagram. The diagram is on the slides when you get it, so yeah. you'll be able to read it then. So. Okay. So in terms of in just increasing content diversity, and we have these on our, we have an uh, analyst lounge downstairs with all this data on the wall. So if you can't focus on it now, um, we will supply this also be in the, the slide where. But some things to point out, um, the major trends are around mobile, social, virtual, and video. Those are the key things that people are demanding more of. 81% um, expect to increase their use of video. 89% um, expect to increase their use of mobile learning. So in terms of the um, reach of our learning content, we're wanting to push it to more devices and to more people with greater accessibility than ever before. And those are really significant changes. Interestingly, so, MOOCs, which is, you know, some, again, mm -hmm. something that obviously a lot of people have talked about, but only 35% of memory. It's not on there, unfortunately, but only 35% of organizations are looking to increase their use of MOOCs at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. sorry, there was somebody had a hand up. No? OK. Yeah. I think the interesting thing about the All the data are, points, just so, uh, oh, I got it. There is a handout thing. There's a few at the back. But if you come down to the analyst lounge downstairs, you've got, then you can pick up a copy of these. There's also, if you go to fosway.com slash LT2016, I think you can download, download the, P, the PDF version of it now. So with some of the summary data, sorry. 
Symptom of? Control. Yeah. So um, I think, I mean, the reality is we know there's a lot of interest in MOOCs. I just don't think corporate training understands how to use them, how to engage with them. They don't understand what the role of them is. So I actually think, I think there's, there are systemic, you know, system-related issues, but I think the biggest issue is it, it, it doesn't compute, if I can put it that, at the moment within the mindset of people who are running learning, unless it does compute, in which case they're using that really extensively. So there's a very kind of uh, um, polarized kind of view. No, they so either stay the same or increase. So all those physics are stay the same or increase. So if they are, not just increase. So actually, the key thing is when you look at it next to 89, 81, 82, actually it's a really low number. I mean, the one that really surprised me was things like, uh, you know, performance support, 71% are looking to actually increase their use or, you know, or maintain it. Now, we know most people aren't doing a lot of it, so therefore, inherently, that means increase. So, yeah, it's, it's a kind of new thing. Rob? No, not EPSS, yeah. but performance support tools of one form or another. Okay, yeah. Okay, do you want to? Okay. So, um, keep going. Keep going. Uh, in terms of the they can't game changes, um, access and delivery. So primarily, um, whose learning infrastructure is in the cloud at the moment? So out as a software as a service? Or How many of your learning systems are in the cloud? How many of them are on premise? On premise. How many are both? <laughs> yeah. So who's actively publishing content to multi-device? Okay. How many of you are publishing content to multi-device for all your content? Okay. Who's, you using, who's using responsive design to publish, so they only publish once? Right. Yeah. Um, I think that in terms of the other thing, Who's seen a massive increase in the use of uh, video to support learning? So who's actually using video a lot more than they've ever used before? I think that's a really significant one. And actually, we tend to pick out these um, changes as being, it's about social, it's about video, it's about mobile. Actually, you probably need to combine all those because it's all those three things together, which actually creates much more impactful activities and outcomes. Um, who one treats one them? question I got before you ask the last one. How many of you are using Tin Can or XAPI at the moment? Okay, whoa, there you go. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> if your vendor supported it, is that, there was a, shall I finish this? Okay, sorry, David. Uh, and who treats their learners like consumers? What does that mean? What does that mean? Discuss. So think about what are the changes that are driven you based on, we talked about changes in what learning is and how we think about it and deliver it from a, from a platforms, from an access, from a delivery point of view. What are the changes also driving you in 2016? So, David's got the mic. Here we go. Great, sir. Andy. 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 Okay. <laughs> I just want to address the very last one to start with because it goes back to the question I was going to ask you when you had your back turned to me, David. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there's a dimension to all of this that is very often missed at these conferences, and that is not all of us are delivering purely to internal staff. Um, and our LMS is owned actually by the worldwide marketing team. We generate 14 million US a year in education revenue to our customers and partners, which puts a very different slant on all of that. Um, for example, 60% um, of our learning is still instructor-led. And it will remain so. That's a revenue generator. The customers like that approach. We are a highly technical company where we actually want them to get their hands dirty on gear as well. But of that 60% of further 60% is virtual instructor led. So it's a very different scenario. And that's what drove our LMS decision originally against what we're currently doing, which is an HR led one based once again on a future work day. Uh, piece. I think they're beginning to feature all over the place as influencing people's LMS. I think that's the key thing. These are all kind of connected in some ways. The, the plates overlap, if you like. You can't just kind of pick and say, well, I'll just look at now 70, 20, 10 model, look at that in isolation. You've got to think about it across all. That's why we sort of thought about it as 
I wanted to create a conversation around the different layers to this and actually think that all of these drive, all of these areas are all driving change in your organization and changing the way that you might want to approach stuff. How do you, how do you kind of meet all of those needs, et cetera, or are you in control of that at all? Um, I'm just picking on the, the last point um, again. What I'm trying to, with the clients that I'm working with, I'm trying to get their learning departments to think of themselves more as a sales department. You know, I'm saying to them, how are you going to market what you've got? You've got, you've spent a lot of them have invested lots and lots of money um, in courses that they maybe have brought in. You know, some really great stuff, but they don't then market it to their internal learners or they don't even think about what are the needs of my customer so it's more pushing it out there without asking the fundamental questions because many of them have come from traditional HR backgrounds no commercial background whatsoever so when I say to them you need to sell this you've got to be a sales organization they look at me in total horror and say well how do we do that and I say well how do you expect why are you looking at um, how many people are using all these courses you've brought in and saying oh why is the take up so poor if you've not, you don't understood your customer, you haven't explained to them what your product is, and you've not marketed it, yeah. what is it? Build it and they will come. Mm. Well, they won't come if you don't tell them about it. So there's a big mindset change, I think, for learning organizations as well. I, I agree completely. The other thing I was going to say, is we go and talk to him about that, Laurent, in, <laughs> um, in L'Oreal, yeah? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's a lot of the, the, they've done, which is really around almost, I, I would say, running learning as if it was marketing, yeah? Mm. Yeah, I'll give it to you after, afterwards, sorry. I, I represent a company called K-Point Technologies, which is a learning, video learning infrastructure vendor. Mm. And we do serve some very large organizations. So I have one point of learning for each. Right. Your bullet one, the big point is that if you pick an LMS, it better support streaming of video as an infrastructure. If it doesn't, it won't serve you in later years, as learning is moving to video. On number two, uh, content, particularly video, has to be multi-device. When you sh publish it, it's got to be multi-device. The devices keep changing. That means there has to be special attention on standards. On bullet number three, uh, since there is a massive increase in the demand for video, there also has to be infrastructure given to all employees to share videos. And that's non trivial for any employee to be able to share video. And millennials do it. They are today the largest demographic as of last year in the workforce, those who were in their teens in 2000. And, uh, you know, on the last point, I think LD wants production quality video all the time. But draw an analogy to selfies. Selfies are like odd angles. Why not look at video selfies and accept them? There will be a lot more sharing. And, and, and that's an area of we're seeing a huge growth around it. Go on, having stitched him up, I'll say something. <laughs> what do you want to know about that? Oh, no, uh, what can I say about uh, our idea of L'Oreal and Vision? It's, uh, it's really to open the system to everybody. So it was one, uh, one of our main point uh, when we redesign everything, uh, the online portal and uh, the concept of a learning company now since one year, it's to really unlock everything. So it's just one system for everybody without any silo, uh, with the freedom of people to create their own path uh, and just treat our employees, our consumer, like an adult. So we manage our website and uh, like an e-commerce website, we try to promote uh, contents, we try to link uh, contents uh, just after, I don't know, uh, one of our CEO speech and just highlight uh, one of the TED uh, video with complexity and with that we may uh, uh, hundreds of uh, access. So we, we give power to the learner, we try to uh, empower them and say, okay, now we can reverse the system. Uh, learning is not just uh, in the end of the learning department, it's everywhere. We, uh, our job as a learning manager, learning director, is to create the learning culture for people and uh, yes, erase everything, reduce friction in the system. So it's uh, one system for everybody and after that, uh, give up our word to the learner. Thank you. And, and I think one of the things that's really interesting to me about the L'Oreal example is obviously it's a business that understands its brand and it understands marketing, yeah? If they don't, then there's no hope for anybody else. And, and 
what is really obvious about the, the, the kind of whole strategy and approach that Lauren's team put together is that that set of values is core to what they do from a learning point of view. You know, when you look at the, the visual, the, the way in which the, the, the whole programs will run out, the, 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 what, the, what their LMS looks like and everything else like that, it's a really, the whole, the whole thing is a brand experience. And I think, so some of that's, you know, that, that point is, and when we look at in learning functions, learning functions are still like basically delivery organizations. They take orders for <coughs> and deliver training events, yeah, whether that's e-learning or otherwise. And we've got to move towards a much more kind of proactive, kind of proactive sense. I just want to quickly, I'm not going to go through this in detail. I mean, there are really significant shifts happening on the technology side. Um, the, you know, the shift to cloud being one of the biggest from a technology point of view, something like 80-odd um, percent of new systems that are putting are basically delivered in the cloud. That's a huge change from where it was four or five years ago. Um, we've got specific data around learning. Learning is no different to anything else. In fact, learning was actually the trailblazer in many organizations, the shift to cloud for HR. So, you know, that's a big factor. User experience is the number one factor, number one, okay? First on the list and one of the most, one of the most significant in terms of the new decisions that organizations are making. And it's not just user interface, it's the user experience, yeah? So what is the total experience you're delivering? And by the way, your admin people are users too, right? <laughs> so giving something that's really sexy on the front end and pig ugly on the back end is not really a good answer. And that, unfortunately, when you look at a lot of the, the uh, historic systems and their transition, there is a kind of split there around the relative maturity of, of a consumerized type user experience. I mean, in my experience, oh. yeah, in my experience, the IT department seemed to trump all of that UX stuff, because I'm totally with that. That's exactly what I think should be driving it. But quite often, systems are bought in because they've already got, as the, the chap mentioned at the back, you know, they're bundled systems and they know it will integrate with this and yeah. they've got one, they've got a relationship with that organization already. So I think it's interesting is, you know, if that was from IT people, I suspect the percentages would have been a lot lower. Yeah, yeah and I think, I think the key thing to understand there, as I said, is you can't separate the layers. Yeah. Yeah, you can't sit there and go, oh, we're just going to do this in terms of the platform choice because it's really dependent on what you're doing in terms of changing the types of learning you're delivering. Yeah? And on the other side, you look at the IT decisions, a lot of the IT decisions are being driven more by a macro HR systems agenda. So they're, they're all connected in some ways on it. But I think one of the interesting things also on top of that is actually the, the brand damage to your culture of having systems that are, just don't have harmony with what your organization says it is. People effectively can smell a rat and they detect, they know that they've got their BS detector that says, you say we are the world's best at X, Y, and Z, and this is the way of things, but you give us this. And I think that's potentially something that is very risky for organizations, and I can understand how IT trump that, but ultimately there are some real sort of long-term impacts that could disrupt your organization much more significantly. Yeah, people hate it, they won't use it. Exactly. But also just in terms of if it's okay to give me a rubbish experience, <coughs> what's it okay for me to do to my customer? So we've got a lot, you know, there's a lot of other kind of content in the slides, which I'm not going to go through now, because we've got 10 minutes and we're going to close. And we probably won't get a, a, sh a shout like we did next door. Um, <laughs> all, all of what we're talking about within this, in, in the micro, is around creating a much more engagement-focused learning kind of offer. Basically, with all these different kind of things and the way in which we'll be able to deliver it, this is driving the agenda for a lot of organizations. It's one of the reasons why there's so much noise about things like LMSs, because they're not really designed. They've been, they were bought for administration purposes and as a way of accessing and tracking and reporting. That's it. Yeah? And that shift, I mean, the vendors get this, by the way. I mean, the vendors have been working on this for some time, um, you know, multiple years. And in, in many ways, the reason that all corporates have a lot of problems is because they're still running a version of the product from the vendors that's five years old or older. So, so the, the vendors get the need for the change, but also it's a big job to actually deliver that change across through the entire product, especially now if that's become a suite or something like yeah, that. And just going back to what you were saying right at the beginning, most organizations are focusing on that um, top layer of functionality, but they're not thinking about the relationship with the learner. And actually, that's probably the most critical thing. You can build a great stadium, but you've got to encourage them to come. And that's about trying to create a relationship with each learner about, so what's your risk profile? as an individual, not what compliance should you do, but what's your risk profile? And actually picking your head every week to say, here's five questions. Oh, that's how this has changed your risk profile. Do you want to actually delve deeper into your compliance training to actually not be such a risk? 
But a way of identifying also wider changes around where your compliance team should be focusing their effort face to face. So these are really important things about actually trying to build a relationship that pull people in, in the same way that a marketing organization would pull you in. Create a relationship. Let's keep you interested. Um, that's some of the things that are really missing. From and the obviously system. now in the modern world, they create that relationship and keep you interested through multiple channels. You know, it's not just magazine, magazine photos or whatever it is and um, adverts on TV. You know, that's a fairly small smart part of their, of their strategy from a marketing perspective to engage you as consumers. Why, how can we introduce some of that thinking into the way that the learning engages with its audiences, whether that's external or internal? I'm not going to go through the, 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 uh, the, the last one just because we've clearly we haven't really got the time, but I think the other key element for all this is ultimately this drives a set of outcomes. The question is, what are those outcomes? How do you track and report those? How do I know you're really making a difference? We get into a lot of debates around, you know, or we do it in the classroom, or we do it on e-learning, and it's going to save us this amount of money. So bloody what? Did it make any difference? Yeah? We can not do it at all, and that will save us even more money. <laughs> so prove to me that you're actually impacting the business in a positive way. And this, this will also drive things, not just in a learning level, um, looking at the way in which we, we focus the learning strategy, align with impact to the business, report impact to the business, <coughs> and so on, but also around investment and, and so on, you know, um, and things like analytics are becoming really important. Again, the analytics agenda in nearly all organizations is being owned at an HR level, not at a learning level. There are very few organizations who have really got any kind of maturity around thinking around learning analytics specifically. Um, and, and, you know, this is all about learning as a function in its own right. What about learning just as a work thing? You know, so, I mean, this is an example we're talking about embedding learning within the business. We've got an integration model that we, we often use, and we talk about the way in which learning integrates with itself, because learning is a multiplicity of things. Learning integrates with talent and, and, and HR agendas, but also learning integrates with work. The bit that's least understood, okay? When you talk about blend, ultimately blend between types of learning is irrelevant. Right? What is really important is around the blend between learning and work. How does learning engage and in deliver work outcomes? Okay, that's ultimately, and this is an area where there's really not a lot of sophisticated thinking, and a lot of organizations are still focusing on come to my LMS, come to my learning portal, rather than I'm doing work, what learning support do I need in that work context to be able to deliver it? Learning is something that's separate to work, which is one of the reasons why the work people don't value the learning people that much. Sorry, but that's true. Yeah. Um, analytics, I mean, we, you know, we haven't got time to talk through it, but I mean, you know, there's, the analytics story is a big, big deal in the HR world. You know, almost every HR conference you'll go to, you'll talk about, um, you'll, you'll, you'll hear people talking about HR analytics, the ability of HR to drive that. There's a lot of focus on a strategic level around building together HR data, including learning data, and aligning that with business and proving and showing association, and then driving, trying to drive specific outcomes. You need to be in that conversation. You can't let your HR colleagues do it, because all it does is marginalize, again, your importance as a function and as a role. Um, and the key thing is a lot of organizations have still been struggling and stuck down here in terms of basically reporting. You know, what about, what about predictive? What about machine intelligence? Some of these technologies are now becoming embedded in the systems, but are you able to, from a functional point of view, do you have the skills and expertise to understand how you're going to drive outcomes from that? How many of you in your organizations at the moment, from a learning point of view, have got any significant kind of analytics project or activity? Okay. One and about three tenths. Yeah? So, and just to sort of reiterate, I think the interesting thing is as you move up the maturity, actually the focus is less on you as an administration function or a delivery function, and actually the focus is much more on the learner themselves. So actually predicting what things you need to do as a learner is actually where the systems are pushing in terms of being transformational. And actually I think that's quite often forgotten by the people who implement the systems. They're thinking, how can we give you more predictive analytics so you know what courses to run? Actually it's about trying to guide the learner. And that's where the transformation really hits in, because that's on a scale different of maybe 100 training administrators or training people, actually it's about 25,000 people in your organization. So just think, one, why do you need to do that? Because when you ask HR what its drivers for analytics are, they come back and say to enable things like leadership or to drive talent pipeline. Those are both hugely relevant agendas to what you do. 
Sorry, I've got no idea what's going on. So, <laughs> so um, one of the things I just wanted to just, just close off in the last minute or so um, is just to talk about how do you get your information to understand what people are really doing. It's easy to come to conferences and you hear people talking about this great initiative. You don't find out they're only doing it in one bit of the business with 200 people. You know? How do you really understand what's going on? And one of the things that we've, um, we've, we have done, as I said, is put in place this relationship with, a, with the Learning Technologies and Learning Skills Group in order to try and get some really meaningful data. If you think of any mature market, there are, there's data out there about how big is it and what do people do and how, what works and what doesn't. And we just don't have that in the learning market particularly well. You know, so, I mean, that's, I think it's really important to think about, you know, obviously market and solution trends. David, can you hold up for me? Yeah, sure. Got so there are things like the nine grid assessments that we do. Some of you will have seen them. Others, go and pick, you can pick up free copies of them downstairs. I mean, our view, our view is we're trying to measure and influence market. We're not trying to sell a product or, or, or um, services. So there's you know, things around trends, but there's also, as Don said earlier, you know, there's this about the, how do we really understand what is the barometer for the market? How do we understand really where the market is? You know, what's the, if you're into cars, what's the JD power thing for you know, the learning technology market? Or whatever it is that tells you how it's really changing and driving. And, and um, that, that is really, really critical. The, the research that we've, we've done, we're talking about in the exhibition a couple of times, and I see you can pick up some cop copies of summary data from the, from the analyst lounge we've got downstairs. But the key thing around that, this is just the start, really. What we want to be able to do is get much more granular data to go with it. So we can put that together with all the conversations we're having around cor corporate trends and realities and actually get a proper objective measures of what's going on. So this is the start of the process, start of the journey, if you like, around it. Um, I think there's huge potential. As I said, we've already had a th approximately 1,000 people engage in the initial research, you know, which immediately puts it at a level beyond where almost everything else is. And it's also not vendor-driven. You know, a lot of the research that you will see out there in the market is basically vendor-driven. So therefore, it's, it's self-serving almost by definition. Even if it's interesting, it's still self-serving to some degree. So please come and um, look at that. We're going to... After, when that research gets published, we'll also make available specific data sheets, including things like action plans. What should you do about it? In other words, take some of the answers to those questions just so that you give you some tools to work out how to engage further. So please kind of contact us and engage with us, and we'll give you a little bit more information around that. Thank you very much. Thank you.